Hello and welcome. The Zip 10 d makes its round on YouTube again, and I thought, I like this old dusty retro stuff so much, so why not to participate? And here it is, a dusty retro stuff. Yeah, well, it has to be about handy, yeah? Hmm, okay. Then what about this? I bought this Tandy 1000 RSX more than a year ago. Unfortunately, there is one bigger problem with it, so I couldn't test it so far and I wanted to come back to it one day. I guess Sip Tandy is the best month to get my hands on it, so let's start. Tandy 1000 RSX is one of the later models and it is fully IBM AT compatible. Actually, it is less Tandy and more an IBM AT with all the pros and contras. If you ask me, the design of this computer is great. It is very slim and minimalistic. Also, the condition of the case is superb. It aged very well and aside of some dirt on the top, I wouldn't complain. There are no scratches or bumps, no yellowing as well, it is almost perfect. Let's take a look at the front. Here we have a precious Tandy 1000 RSX logo. There is only one button on the front, I also can spot any LEDs whatsoever. It is super minimalistic, the floppy drive is also completely integrated into the front panel. On the left there are only some ventilation holes. Ok, what do we have on the back? Unfortunately, I can see some rust, so at least a little bit of work will have to be invested into the case though. And what about connectors? Here we have a VGA port, looks uh, standard to me. Here are probably two PS2 ports for mouse and keyboard, however, I can't tell now which is which, but we will see it early enough. Here is the parallel port and this serial one. Now take a closer look at these ports. Here we have a volume knob, as well as ports for audio and microphone jacks, which should give us some unique Tandy sound. However, in this model there are critical limitations, but we will come back later to this topic. And here we can see again that this is Tandy 1000 RSX model with a hard drive. And right below you can see the root of the problem why it took so long for me to eventually try this machine out. It was manufactured for USA and so it is only rated for 115 volts. However, I live in Germany and here we have 230 volts coming out of the wall. Would I just plug this machine as it is into 230 volts, it would probably instantly catch fire. So I'll have to find a solution for that before I can turn it on. And on the right side again, there are only some ventilation holes. And we are back at the front. Let's take a look inside. You can already see on the torque screws that this machine is not quite standard PC. The top cover, together with the front panel, is held by only two screws. However, Inside there are two metal nails holding the front part of the cover in place. That is why you have to slide the top a little bit to the front before you can remove it. And here are the internals. Kind of mixed bag of standard and custom components. Here we have a standard IDE hard drive. It must be about 100 megabytes. A standard floppy drive with separated power supply. A custom mainboard with the Razer card with two ISA expansion slots. Let's take a closer look at the mainboard. First of all, we have here 386SX 25MHz CPU made by AMD. The chipset is from Headland and I remember it to be quite fast. Here we have a socket for a math coprocessor. And the internal speaker which probably can do 3 voice dandy sound. This is VGA chip, which is good and bad simultaneously. The good is that Ecumos AVGA2 is an excellent VGA chip. It is highly DOS compatible and one of the fastest ISA VGA chips ever existed. Cyrus Logic bought later Ecumos and released the same chip under the name CL GD5402. The bad thing about it is that this Tandy does not support Tandy graphics anymore and many games from that time refuse to output Tandy sound if Tandy graphics cannot be found. But we will come back later to this topic. For now, you can see that there are two unpopulated sockets for a video memory. Currently installed amount of memory is 256 kilobytes, but this can be upgraded to 512 kilobytes. Another nice point is, this mainboard has a cell battery and not a barrel battery like many boards from this time. If you watch my channel, you know how much I hate barrel batteries and what kind of irreversible damage they can produce. 
Not to the memory, this Tendi seemed to have a funny combination. It has one megabyte of memory soldered directly to the main board and has only two additional same memory slots. Currently, there are two sticks installed, each one megabyte, but they can be replaced by two times four megabytes, bringing this machine to a whopping nine megabytes of memory. And this is how the audio circuit looks like from inside, and I guess this chip has among others the responsibility for the audio in and output. Slowly, we are nearing us a problematic power supply. As you can see, there is only one short power cable coming out of the PSU. As far as I understand, the red wire is plus 5 volts. The black one is ground. The purple one must be plus 12 volts if you look at the floppy drive power connector. And the white one must be minus 12 volts. I would say this mainboard has no minus 5 rail, and so some of the old ISA expansion cards like Creative Sound Blaster 2.0 will not work in this machine. Anyway, some plastic parts in this computer became very brittle. Trying to pull out the power connector, the holders broke instantly off. The power cable from the PSU is extremely minimalistic, like everything in this machine. The PSU looks very simple. Let's take a brief look at it. The power cable comes from here. Some Filtering required by FCC is done directly in the connector and it is not part of the actual PSU circuit. The power switch is soldered directly to the PCB. The button cap, which is on the front panel, is obviously pressing directly on the switch. And there we can already see that somebody already tried to use this machine with 230 volts. The input resistor blew up and even burned the isolation. Okay, the power supply is obviously dead. Let's take a look at it. So far, I located two visually broken parts. The main resistor on the high voltage line and the regulator I see completely lost its face. It is used to regulate the inverter, this big yellow part, to raise and lower the power dependent on the load. This must have been quite an explosion because I found the face of the regulator in the other corner of the case. This regulated PSU is actually very simply made. It is divided into parts high voltage and low voltage. These two areas are connected by an optical coupler, the white I see in between. And as you can see, on the back side of the PCB there is a galvanic separation of these two parts to prevent the electrons from jumping over between high voltage and low voltage areas. Maybe you are interested to know how this all works. Well, without going too much into details, the AC voltage comes into high voltage area of the PSU. The AC is then sent through the full bridge rectifier made of four diodes to get it to DC. Then the low pass filtering is made by the big capacitor and we have a steady DC voltage. This is then sent through the inverter, the big yellow transformer in the middle, and on the other side we get 5 and 12 volts AC voltage. This can be then converted into positive and negative DC voltages again, and in this particular PSU this means only plus 5 volts, plus 12 volts and minus 12 volts. The minus 5 volts seem to be not used here. Okay, so far so good. This PSU is made for 150 volts AC. And it is already damaged, because probably someone connected it to European 230 volts plug. But what can we do about it? Actually, there should be no need to touch the low voltage part, since this should remain the same, independent from the input AC voltage. We could only concentrate on the high voltage part, and try to repair that. However, I would like not to do that because of following reasons. First, I would have not only to repair the high voltage part, but also to convert it for 230 volts. I don't have a schematics for this PSU, but it seems not to be too complicated. However, it still could be somewhat tricky, because I would need to analyze the circuits to the last part. I would have to recalculate and exchange some of them. For example, this capacitor is rated for up to 250 volts. This is already not enough for 230 volts AC, since after the full bridge rectifier the voltage can go up to 330 volts. So we would need a capacitor rated for up to 400 volts, which is bigger and could probably be too big for this case. And even if I'd fix and modify the high voltage part, who guarantees that the low voltage part was not also damaged before. Furthermore, I'd like not to have to decide myself for either 150 volts or 230 volts support. 
It would be quite confusing to see 115 volts on the case label and having 230 volts PCU inside. I'd prefer both, if possible. That's why I got another idea. First, let's remove all the components except of the switch and the internal PCU connector, where the mainboard is usually connected to. Uh, some of the component legs have so sharp edges that I cut my finger. But the good news is that all the parts were very easy to desolder and after about 20 minutes I got an almost clear board. We even don't need the cooler anymore and this can be removed as well. Okay, and here comes the simple idea. Since the switch must remain where it is, I left it on the PCB. When I put now the PCB into the case, you can see that we got a lot more free space. Instead of the high voltage circuit, I will integrate this 12 volt 50 watts notebook power supply. It supports both 115 volts and 230 volts AC input and switches automatically to the right mode. Well, I don't know yet how exactly, but I will find the right place. As for the low voltage circuit, I will use this Pico PSU, which takes 12 volt DC from our network power supply and converts it to plus 12 volts, minus 12 volts and plus 5 volts, just as we need it. Such Pico PSU doesn't deliver minus 5 volts, but fortunately we also don't need them here. When I was thinking about this solution, I had my concerns, though, because this Pico PSU delivers most of the power on 12 volt rail, but only up to 30 watts on the 5 volt rail, which means 6 amps. This is extremely low for a retro machine, because almost all the power was pulled out of the 5 volt rail back in the days, and 12 volts were usually less relevant. However, a closer look at the original PCB revealed that the original PSU was even less powerful and delivered only up to 3.3 amps on the 5 volts rail. This would mean that the Pico PSU should still be sufficient and even deliver almost twice as much power as the original PSU. First, I removed the main power connector and tried to place the notebook PSU right in the end. However, it didn't fit there, so I decided to put the PSU right in the middle of the PCB where all the old parts were sitting. The Pico PSU should go somewhere in the end, like so. Unfortunately, the original main power connector is just too big. It contains the filters which are required by FCC, however, they all are also inside of the notebook PCBs, and so I decided just to replace the original connector with a simpler one without any filters, but also a lot smaller. The main connector on the case can internally be simply wired to the notebook PSU. Therefore, I solder a simple PSU cable to forward the voltage. Safety first, so I also solder the ground wire to connect it later to the case. The 12V DC output of the notebook PCU will be just connected to the switch on the original PCB. I could also use the switch to control the main wire, but I decided to go low voltage as soon as possible and not to have any high voltages on the PCB anymore. So this is how the main power supply looks like. Now let's take a look at the Pico PCU, where we will get 12V converted to plus minus 12V and 5V rails. We don't need all the Molex connectors, so they can be just unplugged. I soldered the red and black wires of the 12 volts input onto the PCB near the switch and added some simple bridges and diode to prevent the circuit from reverse polarity. Pico PCU is usually used to directly be plugged into an ATX mainboard. As you probably know, it is controlled digitally by the mainboard and will not turn on if just connected to the power. This can be worked around by shorting the pin 16 to the ground. This way Pico PCU will turn on instantly as soon as 12V power is on. Another four cables are going into the original PCB to power the header. In this case black is ground, red is plus 5V, yellow is plus 12V and green is minus 12V. 
For the other end, I used a small piece of thick copper electrical cable which fits perfectly into the ATX connector like so. It is sitting very tightly and the cables can be soldered directly to this thick wire. The right cable must then be pushed into the right hole. I said into the right hole, don't repeat my mistakes and double check everything twice. Pay attention that I have a 24 pin Pico PSU, there are also 20 pin models out there. Everything connected, it is time for the first test. With the switch turned off, we should have no voltages on any rail. Now with a switch turned on, we have 5 volts, 12 volts and minus 12 volts. Looks great so far. Okay, I use some zip ties to get everything in shape. This is how it looks like. The notebook piece you will take a place about here. However, it slides back and forward and I would like to have everything tied in place. With a hole through the PCB and another zip tie, everything should remain in place. Here's the piece of cardboard which was used for isolation. It still has this burn mark. It seemed to stick there and I couldn't get it off with an IPA. Anyway, I call it scars of time. If it doesn't want to go away, it deserves to stay. The cardboard protects the PCB from shorting to the ground, but this backspace where Pico PSU should go is a blank metal, so I'll cover it with some electrical tape. And this should be the final result. Let's do the check again. By the way, repeat it as much as possible. It is better to test twice than to fry your hardware once. Anyway, 5 volts, 5 volts, 0 volts, 0 volts, 12 volts, and minus 12 volts. Excellent. Time to put the PSU back into our Tandy. Unfortunately, I had to cut off the zip tie which holds the notebook PSU in place. All the zip ties I had were too short, so I had to bind two together. In the end one knot was in the way and so I couldn't insert the whole construction. Anyway, for now I'll just slide the notebook PSU into the case separately and later I'll buy some longer zip ties to fix it properly. Now, fingers crossed, let's turn it on. Yay, and the dead guy is alive again. It complains about invalid configuration, but I guess this is a story for the next time. I think this video was already long enough anyway. Next time I would like to make some cleaning and checking if the hard drive is alive and, if yes, see what is on there. I would like to take a deeper dive into the software, make some upgrades, test the Tendi sound and set up the system as I would like to use it. And so far, I am very glad that the PSU problem is finally solved and I hope you guys will join me next time for continuation. And as always, please don't forget to leave your comments, likes or dislikes below. Your feedback helps the channel to gain its popularity and me to make even more interesting content for you. Thank you and goodbye.